So for today's lesson, we're going to talk about from chapter six, lesson five, indirect proofs. And as you can see, our lesson objective is simply the I will be able to write indirect proofs. Now, when you're trying to prove something, I've got to be honest, these are my favorite. But they're a little bit backward. OK, and you'll see what I mean once we start doing these. Suppose you're babysitting your neighbor's child, Billy, and their dog one afternoon after school. While you're watching Toy Story, AKA the best Disney movie ever, with Billy in the family room, you hear a loud crash in the dining room. The dog knocked over and broke the family's expensive vase. The parents come home from work and blame you, the babysitter, for breaking the vase. You explain your innocence to the parents as follows. This is where it's going to be like argument. All right, now let's suppose I did break the vase. And that means I would have had to be in the dining room to break the vase. But I was in the family room watching Toy Story with Billy. Billy can verify that I was in the family room when the vase broke. If I broke the vase, I would have had to be in two places at once, which is impossible. I could not have broken the vase. Therefore, you would have used um, what we call indirect reasoning to plead your case. In other words, when we reach something that's impossible, and by the way, we're going to do this little symbol, that means contradiction. It, it means we've reached an impossibility. Therefore, logically speaking, something else has to happen than what we supposed. So what you do is you start by making um, the false or opposite assumption that the desired conclusion was false. You then showed that this assumption led to a logical impossibility. And then, if what you supposed was false is proven to be impossible, then what's left is truth. It has to be true if what you've chosen is false becomes impossible. It's sort of like a double negative, like saying, I ain't got none, which absolutely must mean that you have something Hopefully you're following this. So this is a logical impossibility that we're looking for. And that's what I mean by backwards. So here's how you do it. This is how to write the steps. First, you identify the statement you want to prove. And then you temporarily assume that this statement is false by assuming the opposite. You reason logically until you reach what we call a contradiction. And you can think of this as an impossibility, contradiction. Okay. So if you reach an impossibility with something false, you point out that the desired conclusion must then be true because the contradiction proves the temporary assumption false. So here's what you think. If false, then false. Do you remember when we did um, logic tables? Because if that's the case, then overall, the statement is true, logically speaking. Actually, we, we didn't do all of the, the logic chapter, but this is how it works. If you prove something that you assumed was false can't happen, then it must be true. So here's an example. We're going to write an indirect proof that in a given triangle, there can be at most one right angle. And you're given a triangle. So you're given a triangle, let's say A, B, C. All right. Now we're gonna do a little paragraph proof. We're just gonna talk through this. But if I wanna show that ABC can have at most one right angle, 
then I'm going to assume temporarily that that is not true. Okay, so I'm going to assume temporarily that ABC does have more than one right angle. Okay, so <clears throat> let's say it has these two right angles. Uh, so let's say angle A, angle B are right angles. Okay, that means that their measurement is equal to 90 degrees, right? Hopefully everybody's following this. Now, um, I have a theorem from very early on in the chapter. This was called the triangle sum theorem. The measure of angle A plus the measure of angle B plus the measure of angle C has to equal 180 degrees, right? Well, if that's the case, then this is 90 and this is 90. And that leads us to say that the measure of angle C equals zero, which is impossible. So there's our contradiction. You can't just say that an angle has zero degree measurement, right? So if, if we've just shown, it, shown a contradiction, then that means that this supposition here, this temporarily assume, is false. So that means it has to be true. <laughs> so you're assuming the opposite and then you're showing that that can't happen. Therefore, what's left is the truth. Therefore, ABC can have only one, uh, at most one right angle, which I would write down here, but I don't have any more space on my page. So that's my my fault there, but that's, you would just write that last conclusion. Okay, any questions? All right, so, you know, I'm trying to save paper, so I'm going to erase this before I go on to the next um, page here. Oh, right there. Okay. And that's Indirect proofs. We're going to do a little more practice on those, but for now we're going to move on to the next theorem. Okay. Um, in this next part, we're going to talk about the relationships of sides and angles. So if we use this angle here, what it says is color the largest angle and the largest side the same color. So this one's the largest angle. And this one is the longest side. And then it says do the same with the smallest. So this looks like the smallest angle here. And this is the smallest side, sort of clearly, right? What do you notice about these pictures? Well, you know, if I'm looking at this, I'm, I'm going to do... Um, Let's see, the yellows are going to be the largest. So what I notice is that the large angle and side are opposite each other. Right, these are across from each other and also the same for the smaller.
angle inside. That's what I noticed. Well, guess what? This relationship holds true for all triangles. The smallest angle will be across from the smallest side, and the largest angle will be across from the largest side, always. And so that's relating sides and angles of a triangle. This is the second part of 6.5. And so we can take this relationship, which is always, always true, and we're going to make two theorems, okay? One is called the longer side theorem. And the other one, as you can see down here, is called the larger angle theorem. So here's how it works. If one side of a triangle is longer than another side, which here you can see that AB is longer than BC, right? This is eight and that's five. Then the angle opposite the longer side is larger than the angle opposite the shorter side. So if I was going to say color code this, It would be that this is what you'd put. You'd put, well, since AB is greater than BC, then the measure of angle C, which is across from AB, is greater than the measure of angle A. And I could even color code that more too if you want. So AB and C. Because this way it'll stick out in my head a little bit more. There's one thing I do want to let you know about that's a little tiny bit um, confusing. When you're looking at these symbols, I know the greater than symbols look a lot like, um, well, the less than symbols look a lot like angles. So whenever you see the angles, it's always flat on the bottom. See how it's flat? But if you see greater than, it's sort of cattywampus. Like it's always, you know, looks like a mouth, like a hungry alligator mouth. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at the screen. So here's how you would do an example of that. You're constructing a stage prop that shows a large triangular mountain. The bottom edge of the mountain is 32 feet. The left slope is 24 feet. And the right slope is 26 feet. List the angles in order from smallest to largest. So you go from the smallest side and the angle L will be the smallest because it's, so uh, the measure of angle L is less than, this will be the middle, so that'll be J. So the measure of angle J, and that's gonna be less than the largest side is K, measure of angle K. So be careful on those notes. It works both ways. So we also have the larger angle theorem. If one angle of a triangle is larger than another angle, so 50 is larger than 30, then the side opposite the larger angle is longer than the side opposite the smaller angle. Okay. So we'll go for the big one here and the small one here with our colors. So basically right here you would write well. Okay, the measure of A is greater than the measure of angle C. So that means that BC is greater than AB. And again, AB is green. C is green. Try to make this as colorful as possible, you know. B, C is yellow, and A is yellow. Okay. Any questions? You know, if you look at the pictures, it sort of makes sense. It's one of those things that always made sense to me in geometry. Like, oh, yeah, okay, I can see that relationship. And that just always happens. So now we have um, the two theorems that say that, the angles and the sides. And then we have one more theorem, and that's called the triangle inequality theorem. So now we're gonna order them, and it is one more page. 
of notes here, but as you can see, the notes are a lot of pictures. That's why they're taking so many pages. So if you can figure out how to do it electronically, that's even better. Okay. Now, as far as this goes, um, also, we are not going to be doing this proof right now because it's already going to take us too long. I don't want to hurt your brains. But we are going to do um, this problem here. Okay, so list the sides of DEF in order from shortest to longest. So I have angle measurements here. And so what I have to do is figure out what that measurement is. Which if you add 51 and 47, that's 98. So 180 minus 98 gives me 82. Okay. And now we have our smallest, our medium, and our largest. So here's the smallest. It's across from DF. So DF is smallest. This is the middle. It's across from EF. EF is the middle. And 82 is the biggest, so that's across from DE. And hopefully you can see that's how the theorem works. It's pretty simple. Okay. Now, um, there is one other thing that, that this is a really important theorem in all of geometry, and it's basically how to build stuff. So especially if you want to be a carpenter, an architect, anything like that, there are certain numbers or sides that will work to form a triangle, and then there's some that won't. So here's some examples. If you have lengths of sticks that are two and four and five, you can actually make them. These marks are for constructions, which we're not doing. But you wouldn't be able to draw them. You wouldn't be able to stick them together with toothpicks, nothing like that. So this actually would work. This would work here. But this one, the two and the two, there's no way they can come together. They're too short. And also, say I had a two and a three. Well, even if they came, they won't connect until they get right here. So that also doesn't work. So that leads us to this conclusion which is the triangle inequality theorem. It says the sum of the lengths of any two sides of a triangle is greater than the length of the third side. So for instance, in this picture, what that means is that if you take the length of AB and you add it to BC, AB plus BC, has to be greater than AC. And if you add AB to AC, it has to be greater than BC. And if you add AC and BC, it has to be greater than AB. Now, you may think, well, what the use, you know, what good is this? But it does have very practical applications. And again, we're going to do one more example because I still have you. It's uh, just 11.58 now. Okay. Hopefully you have that written down. I've got to erase. I can go on. And you'll see how this works. All you really have to do is figure out, I'm going to give you some three sides. So it would be like handing you sticks of, of size 4, 9, and 10 and telling you telling me, okay, does this work? Does this actually work? And so what you have to do is check all three possibilities. There's three possibilities. Is 4 plus 9 greater than 10? Yes. Is 4 plus 10 greater than 9? Yes. Is 9 plus 10 greater than 4? Yes. So this is a happy face. This one works. You can build a triangle out of sides 4, 9, and 10. How about B? 
Can I draw a triangle out of 8, 8, and 18? So is 8 plus 8 greater than 18? No, 16 is not greater than. So this is a nope. It's a sad face. So you want to see? Check all your possibilities. Is 5 plus 7 greater than 12? You know what? It's not. 12 is not greater than 12. So it has to strictly be greater than, and this is also a nope. Okay, that's how that theorem works. Very straightforward. And then the one last thing we can do here is, if you have a triangle that has a side length of 14 and another side length of 9, there's two possibilities for that third side x. Either x is longer than both of these, or x is shortest. So what you have to do is figure out, um, and there's so many possibilities that you can only find a range, okay, a range of things that they can be. But let's do it. If x is the smallest side, then what we would do is we would treat this like the smallest and write x plus 9 has to be greater than 14. This plus this has to be greater than 14. And of course, you would subtract 9 from both sides and you get x has to be greater than 5. Right? Case number 2. What if x is the largest? Okay, so now this is the biggest, and then this is the second biggest. So if they, so these two have to be bigger than this one. So it's 14 plus 9 has to be greater than x, if that's our third, third largest size, which means 23 has to be greater than x. So any number that's less than 23, but greater than 5, you can make a triangle out of with this picture. You would be able to build that. You can see this has lots of applications, but then if you want to just write it as one, you know, final, you would write that 5 is less than x, which is less than 23. And that would be your final answer for the possible lengths of the third side. You're going to get a chance to practice this on your own, but for right now, are there any questions that I can answer? Okay. And that was a full 25 minutes there, so um, I'll be done with the notes for now.